Mr. Rue, what I'd like to do is start with multiple comment cards uh, and uh, go from there. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we'll hear those first, starting uh, with Armando Herman, who has filled out comment cards on multiple items. And you have two minutes, Mr. Herman. Does that include general public comment? I don't have a general public comment card from you. Yes, you do. Oh, yeah, PC. I have one. Okay, so three minutes for everything. Excellent. Two minutes and then one minute. Excellent. Now that we're here in these meetings, it's, this is the Tales of the Crips. And then regarding item number six, communication by the fucking mayor, Eric Assetti, for appointment of Miss Nicole Chase. Now, is this Chase Bank? No, this is for the zoo animal commissioners. You know where they got little pigs? <coughs> And sometimes a, an area for petting animals like goats. <laughs> and then I go to item number four, another fucked up mayor report, reappointment of the Native American Indian, Mr. Herman, for a commission. No, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, I am Native American and crazy, but they call me crazy horse for the record. So the point I'm trying to state here is there was no statement come. Submitted, meaning that the lady has possible, who knows, soft porno. I don't know. Now, general public comment. When it comes to the Brown Act, there have been multiple violations, like I can't believe what you did to Miss Renee. A lady who's talking about a bluff off the Santa Monica area by who other than the road fucking diet idiot drug addict, Mike Bonin. And it's time that we recall Mike Bonin. Recall Mike Bonin. Why? Because you can't drive anywhere in Los Angeles anymore because the stupid asshole, quote unquote Sheila Q, we would say, the idiot moron continues to block the traffic, causing more congestion and the majority of us are going to have bad, unfortunate health the same way the L.A. Fire Department is suffering from cancer. <laughs> are you forfeiting your general public comment? Oh, or we're to oh, oh, you let me go off topic. Thank you. you well, I, wanna, I, I always like to praise the chair when you're, when you're politically correct and you allow the public to state their opinion. I, I, I thank you because that's the way a system works. You want to avoid vulgarity, offensive language, and, and, and no attacks because the 54954.3.C, the Ralph M. Brown Act, does allow you to criticize anyone in a quorum, including politicians. However, when you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. I'm not like John Walsh. <laughs> See, now Mr. Walsh talks about cocks. I, on my part, like pussies, like Englander that run away from me. Be a man, bitch. Don't run from the trooper. The reason why I'm in my trooper suit is because I'm in the war, in the trenches. Fuck you. So for anyone who has never attended a committee hearing or a city council meeting, just know that... Uh, Everyone is entitled to say whatever they want, as long as they stick to the items on agenda items and then a general public comment, anything they want at all. And that's just the First Amendment at work on our behalf. So uh, I always like to apologize on some of the commenters' behalf for rude, insensitive, racist, ignorant remarks that get made because no one should really have to suffer through this nonsense, but it's just part of the deal. So I appreciate everyone's patience uh, and pol apologize for the offensive language. Uh, next we have uh, Wayne Spindler. General uh, public comment, one minute, and uh, multiple comment cards, yes. uh, two minutes. Yes, go ahead. Yes, now we get to item number one, city bike share. Fuck city bike share. Yes, and again, we apologize for that horrible language, bike share. It's such a terrible word. We're so sorry about that. 
I don't do herbicide roundup. We need to get rid of the rats at City Hall. Yes, there's 15 of them. Yes, a couple of them are good rats, but some of them are bad rats. Yes, yes, they have greedy little beady eyes, and they have all kinds of office holder accounts. They are definitely rats, and they need to be rounded up and sent to the FBI. Yes, that's right. I support that number, too. Thank you. Then we have the Native American Indian Commission. Oh, another politically correct do-nothing body. Yes, we fully support that. Puppets Andrea Garcia? Yay! Randall Murphy? Yay! Chrissy Castro? Yay! More puppets on more puppet commissions? Yes, what are we going to do with the American Indian Commission? Are we going to give tax breaks on American Indian cigarettes? I support that. What about Native American Indigenous Day? We already passed it. So what are we going to do with the Native American Indian Commission to help? Not a goddamn thing, yes. But you continue to write more reports. Then we have Nicole Chase of Chase Bank buying her way onto the zoo commissioner's statement. We support that, yes. And finally, number seven, I haven't even read it. I'm a puppet. I can't read. Fuck it, yes. Okay, one minute for general. Yes, so we get to our general public comment. Arts, entertainment, parks, and rivers. It's mixing too much shit at one time. Murals are art. So is tagging. When you get rid of a tagging, think of the artist, the gang member who puts that X and those three I's. The intelligence level. Another LAUSD graduate. So whenever you look and see tagging on the wall, realize that that's the work of Nuri Martinez, that stupid bitch, and another failed LAUSD graduate. A great, great man named Ref Rodriguez tried to save the school, and then he gets indicted by Jackie Lacey for having the nerve to try to educate these stupid fucking kids. So again, we support Ref Rodriguez. And finally, fuck that beach, Nori Martinez. She's a beach. Thank you. After this these eloquent remarks we just heard. Uh, Mr. Rue, what I'd like to do is uh, take item seven on consent. Uh, thank you. And what I'd like to do now is take uh, items three, uh, four, and five together. We'll start with that. If you could read uh, the items, please, Mr. Sutton Willis. Certainly. <clears throat> Item number three, communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Andrea Garcia to the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission. Item number four, communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Mr. Randall Murphy to the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission. Item number five, communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Ms. Chrissy Castro to the Los Angeles City County Native American Commission, Indian Commission. Item number six, communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Nicole Chase to the Board of Zoo Commissioners. So let's just do items three, four, and five uh, to start with. So I know I see Mr. Murphy, I see Ms. Castro, and I, I believe Ms. Garcia is here as well. Please step forward and uh, have a seat. It would be helpful to have some sage right about now that we could burn, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, all right, so, so welcome. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on your reappointments, Mr. Murphy and Ms. Castro. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on your selection, Ms. Garcia. Thank you. So just really generally speaking, what challenges, opportunities do you see in the near future for the county city commission? Start with you, Ms. Castro. Sure. Well, our 
community is very excited about the level of community organization that we experienced with the passage of Indigenous Peoples Day in the city and county of Los Angeles. And we held a community forum on September 23rd to talk about how we were going to continue to use that level of organization to work on other issues that were of concern to our community. And so we're looking at educational reform. Um, recently, we've seen that a model curriculum um, is going to be established by the year 2020 um, in order to make sure that, that Native American studies and accurate history is available to uh, students in ninth through 12th grade. So that's something that we want to work on. Um, additionally, the social sciences framework uh, that, that was recently adopted is going to um, omit the mission project um, and for fourth grade students, which we're very excited about. And so that's one area that we're working on. Um, our community is also interested in housing and homelessness. Um, as well as looking at, uh, continuing to look at the invisibility of Native peoples in Los Angeles. So we're currently, um, have been asked by Supervisor Solis to uh, develop recommendations on how to make sure Indigenous peoples are visible, um, which includes the potential removal of the Columbus statue in Grand Park. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of other issues we're working on, census policy, advocacy, um, but I'll just stop there as those being some of the highlights. Well, that's some highlights, yeah. and we're in a very, <laughs> very interesting and promising era yeah. with um, reestablishing the accurate historical record um, for the benefit of everyone. And your role in that uh, is widely known, and, and we thank you for that. Thank and you. thank you for serving on the commission and for being willing to stay on the commission doing this important work. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Murphy, a, another uh, veteran of the commission, um, good to hear from you, sir. Thank you, Council Member O'Farrell and uh, uh, Council Member Rue. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk to you. Council Member Rue, I live in your district. It was, a put, it was an honor supporting you when you uh, were running against uh, uh, Mr. Labonja's former chief of staff, and I'm very glad to see the outcome. Um, there are a number of issues which Ms. Castro has already addressed, so I'm not going to replicate what she said. Uh, in addition, in, over the course of the last few years and moving forward, we have done a great deal of work in reorganizing the structure of the commission itself and creating a greater level of accountability to, to not only our own indigenous population, but to the council uh, here and to the uh, board of supervisors. Along those lines, we have established a uh, a job description uh, at the county level for the executive assistant. We are now advertising for an, uh, an executive assistant, so that position will become much more formalized. Uh, in addition, we are working with Councilman O'Farrell's uh, staff on uh, reworking uh, the ordinance and the agreement between the city and the county, which funds the commission. Uh, currently, the commission's budget uh, is somewhat ambiguous as far as the allocation of various funds, and I think some clarification is necessary. And, I believe the, uh, the council member is on board with that, and I believe the uh, Board of Supervisor uh, Cool is also on board with it. And we are hoping to move forward to, to delineate the lines so that the commission has an operating budget going forward, which we have not had for a number of years now. Uh, and so those, are those, those types of changes will allow the commission to better deliver our services to the community that we serve, which as uh, everyone here knows, I'm sure, is one of the poorest, if not the poorest, uh, communities in the Los Angeles uh, city area and the county area and the services that we provide and the, the conduits that uh, that we help structure for delivery of services and information uh, is not replicated anywhere else in the systems. So I appreciate the opportunity to continue to serve the uh, indigenous population of uh, the city of Los Angeles and uh, I'm certainly interested in answering any questions you may have uh, about our work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. And as a fellow Irish Native American, um, <laughs> it, it, it's great to have you on the commission as well. And your work uh, uh, in reference to what Ms. Castro was talking about has also not gone unnoticed. So thank you for serving and thank you for, for willing, being willing to stay on the commission. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, and we have uh, Ms. Garcia, a new appointee. We're thrilled to have you aboard. And Please tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your ideas and, and uh, goals for serving on the commission. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for uh, having me here and uh, finally being 
at this point in the process. So um, I personally, um, my tribes are Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara from the Fort Worth World Reservation in North Dakota, but I'm a lifelong born and raised resident here in uh, Los Angeles, uh, Santa Fe Springs, and Norwalk in particular. Um, so I am a physician trained in general and preventive medicine, and I am completing a fellowship in research and policy. And so I hope to bring that health lens into the commission. Um, for me personally, as someone in general in preventive medicine, I feel that everything that we're doing in terms of boosting socioeconomic status, um, you know, combating homelessness, providing different sorts of um, resources as they relate to social determinants of health, in the end to me is all about health. And so in my personal work, um, my goal is to improve the health status and systems for natives living in Los Angeles County. But to the extent that I can bring that lens into the work that we're doing on the commission, um, I would, I'm overjoyed to be able to help and, and lend that voice where it's needed. That's wonderful. And just, I think the, the wider population, Ms. Casper, you mentioned invisibility, doesn't realize the statistics and you just name the affliction, and in Native America, it's off the charts. And in LA County alone, 25% uh, of Native Americans are uh, suffer from clinical depression. I mean, it, we can never undo 500 years of genocide, but we can certainly address the aftermath with this current generation. I think that's what all of us are on board to do. Uh, and so having you as an addition with your perspective is going to help a whole lot. I'm really lucky to join at such a good time when we're really sort of um, optimizing our infrastructure and also building on the momentum of Indigenous Peoples Day right. and other movements. So I'm really lucky and excited to get to work. Also Wonderful. just, if I could just yes. share that Andrea has already contributed to the work of the commission. She volunteered to write a health policy report that we partnered with the UCLA um, Lewis Policy Center with. Um, and so she contributed her volunteer time to that, and that's when actually we established a relationship with her and um, realized the, you know, all of the contributions that she has a desire to make, and, and we believe that she will make to the commission. That's terrific. And I would, I would add, I think something you three already understand, the whole commission probably has a sense of this, but I think that our, your responsibilities have grown beyond the county of LA with the movement that's happening, and also taking stock of the role that you've already played. And I think that is one of those factors that is not in the description, um, but it's already playing out. So having that awareness as well is, is really terrific. Uh, Mr. Rue, I welcome you to ask Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I know you're greatly involved in this, and this is an issue that's uh, uh, very near and dear to your heart, and I just really wanna thank all three of you for your continued service and your new service, uh, even though you've been very involved to Ms. Garcia, Mr. Murphy, and Mrs. Castro. Um, and especially Mr. Murphy, uh, being a resident of Council District 4, thank you so very much. But also, I know Ms. Castro, you were a constituent in my district as well, but um, I know you, uh, you moved to Council District 1, but it's okay. <laughs> but thank you for your service, and uh, I really appreciate everything that you're doing for the city of Los Angeles, I mean, especially for this issue. Um, I have one question, though, but I think this might be more for the chair. I know this is a joint city-county commission. Are there two vacancies still, or? Uh, this, or is there that, are two. Oh, so, wow, yeah, so. so. So, but what we do is we take the recommendation of the commission, mm -hmm. uh, uh, first and foremost, but if any of us have uh, ideas for individuals yeah. to submit, then, uh, I think we're all open open to that. Right, it's a very important commission, and, and I know um, uh, vacancies might be harder with quorum, so I, I think we should definitely look into, um, um, and I know the chair and myself would, be rec would welcome recommendations from yourselves as well. So uh, hopefully we can fill the rest of the commission and we could urge the mayor to fill them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I think that's it. I think that uh, Mr. Rue and I are unanimously in support of <laughs> your new appointment and your reappointment, and you'll move to council. Thank you, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks again, you bet, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Sutton Willis, I think we'll go to item one now. Uh, we can hear item one. Item number one, the Los Angeles Department of Transportation report relative to the city's bike share program and its potential impact on the film industry. Terrific, and I have Mr. Marcel Porras to represent D LADOT. Yes. Uh, Please Thank you. begin your presentation. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Marcel Porras, Chief Sustainability Officer at LADOT. 
Um, I'm here to um, to report on the the bike share program, particularly how we've worked with the film industry, um, both from the the establishment of the pilot program in downtown Los Angeles and um, an update on on, on how, how that's gone. And so I think early on with the film industry prior to the to the launch of the downtown LA system, LA DOT um, worked with the film industry and convened by um, by board president um, Kevin James to establish a process for um, removal or shutdown of stations. In those discussions, I think one of the things that um, that was a, a major concern was specifically around, um, that was presented was specifically around period pieces um, and the impact of, of the city of, uh, and the ability of the shot to um, and the bike share stations not to reflect or, or impact um, those types of, of films. I think through um, through other discussions um, and more recently understanding that there may also be an impact on 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 other types of shoots as well and their ability to um, to film in certain locations. But um, I think it is important to note that we did create a process um, working with Metro. I think a key reminder for um, for the committee is that. Our bike share program is a partnership with Metro, and Metro has a contract with a operator named Bicycle Transit Systems. And so um, the city um, pays a portion of the operations and maintenance for the program. That is 65% uh, of the total O&M, and we pay for 50% of the capital. Um, but ultimately, the contract and the perform and the, the key performance indicators are set by Metro through their board process. Um, so when we got to the work of establishing a, a, a process and protocol for um, removal and shutdown of stations, um, it was one of the key um, emphasis that we had was that it not be a profit center for the program, that it simply worked to um, um, to accommodate the, the film industry without not taking an additional cost or loss to, to the program, both Metro um, and the city of Los Angeles. And so, um, um, so that, that was clear. Um, since the, the completion, since, the, um, since we've launched last August, so we've now been operating for um, approximately 14 months, um, there have been two instances where the film industry has requested um, uh, a shutdown of a station. And again, we have four options with them varying from just shutting down the station, leaving the, bi the bikes on site, all the way to actually uh, removing the station infrastructure altogether. Temporarily for the shoot. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, taking it, moving it to a warehouse, storing it. Um, and, and those costs include, you know, a van rental, um, mobilizing a team, a crew to come out, remove. Um, I think, again, also important to know is that in selecting the infrastructure technology, we were very cognizant of being able to um, select an infrastructure that was easily removable. Um, so our bike share stations are not, um, are not hard hardwired, they're solar powered, and they're not bolted in. And so they're, they, they literally just lay down on the ground. And so, um, so um, since the pilot launched, we have had um, two instances where the stations have been shut down um, for, for film to accommodate filming. Um, I think there might be other instances of, of, um, uh, of inconvenience, but I think I'll let the film industry speak to that. Um, and I think um, moving forward, I think working closer, closer with the film industry to establish um, kind of a clear um, outreach strategy uh, for engaging the film industry. We do a couple of things, I think mainly, um, and, and it's gonna vary within the city depending on the geography in, in downtown Los Angeles. We spend a lot of time doing outreach ourselves, our staff. Um, in the example of Council District 11 and a rollout in Venice, Council Member Bonin's staff was very active and almost preferred to take the, um, the, the the leadership role in community engagement and, and outreaching. Um, there's also an online um, um, crowdsourcing tool that we use that is allows um, stakeholders to um, to provide input on future site locations. I think, um, looking back now, we might spend some time more closely with the film industry reviewing that map and looking at where potential expansion areas are. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. If, uh, stick around for a minute. We'll ask questions, but I'd like to, uh, we have two speaker cards on the side. So let's do that next, and then we'll sure. ask questions. So uh, Ed Duffy, uh, Teams for Local 399, and Sarah Walsh from the MPAA. Thank you, Council Members. Um, Ed Duffy with Teamsters Local 399. We represent drivers, location managers, capacity directors, and others in the film industry. Um, when, um, when we saw this report, um, we had a couple of comments about it. One is we wanted to make it very clear that the decisions about the shutdown and relocation process that was created, we saw as being way very expensive, that it would be something that we wouldn't necessarily do very often. I mean, what's basically happened is even though the, the two times that it happened only happened twice, there were a number of times where they did workarounds. I mean, it, sometimes it's simpler to just buy a couple of tap cards and move the bikes themselves, which is something I don't think anybody really wants because it, um, it just becomes an issue of the bikes not being there. Um, but that does happen quite a bit. Um, the, um, the, the, when that whole process was worked out or, or decided, um, we really didn't have a much input in it. It was basically, we kept asking about it and kept wanting to know when we were going to know what to do, and then we were just given the process. So that's where it was left. Thank I you. think the other biggest problem... And, and just wrap up since... Yeah, I know. I'm going to do minute. this very quickly. And then, but we are going to get to the point you just made. And I, I think the other problem... Do you want to do the other one? Well, Go sure. Ahead. All right. <laughs> we're a tag team. You know, right. I see Thank us you. everywhere. Um, I think the other issue is, is about the station location specifically. Um, we did work with DOT a little bit on some of the the locations downtown, but as it relates to the ones in CD11 in Venice, we were not consulted at all about the locations for those bike share. And I know Ed and his members have had a couple of problems with um, certain stations in the area. Um, in your district recently, there was the, the bike share that went in at, by Echo Park. We were given a heads up by your office, mm -hmm. but not by DOT. So we, we still feel like we're not getting the level of communication that we've talked about in this committee and in other places not just related to the green paint, which we have hopefully finally solved, but um, other issues of concern to us. And why that's so important is because if these are placed in highly filmed areas, Ed's members and others are just going to take the bikes out and move them somewhere else. Or we're going to remove the station and then it's not going to be in use anyway when it could maybe have been moved around the corner or a few yards down the street and still have the desired effect. So that's what we would like to work with DOT on and we think we can work this out most of the time. We're not going to care where the station is, but in certain circumstances, the location is extremely important. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and you're welcome to stay because I might, we might want to ask you some questions as well. Okay. Um, one thing that's really important when, when uh, I'm very, it was very supportive of the Metro bikes at Echo Park Lake, but not in a vacuum. So I, I uh, um, asked Phil Maley specifically um, brought Phil Mellie in and said, okay, this is where they're likely to be placed. Will that be a problem to you? What are your thoughts? And it was generally, okay, this shouldn't be a problem. So that was kind of my green light for saying, okay, this should be okay. Um, but those decisions should never be made in a vacuum. And one of the recommendations I'm going to make is to require um, that all departments attend the quarterly task force meetings before any decisions are made. Um, so, so that's one of the requirements, but I don't want to jump ahead too far. So I, I guess the question I have for DOT staff is, uh, how often do you meet with the film coordinators uh, from, uh, from Film LA? Um, so LADOT has, um, attends the quarterly um, task force meeting. I think that in terms of bike share being a regular standing item on that, I don't think that is something that has been, that I think we could work into making sure that just within our own internal LADOT process, mm -hmm. that that is, um, that there are reports ready for that, particularly as we look at expansion as well. And Marcel, is it is it the same person who develops an institutional knowledge of the issues, or is it just someone who goes and takes notes and reports back? In other words, is it someone who participates in and it's actually a working discussion. Sure. So the LADOT representatives that um, attend, it's a combination of either Jennifer Cohen, who's our um, council liaison and government affairs um, 
director or Bridget Smith, our chief of staff. Mm -hmm. okay. um, because one of the, uh, the points that I observed many months ago, you alluded to, to a little bit, Sarah, in terms of the placement in the first place, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that it's going to vary from council office to council office and the perspective that the council member has on that. Um, but in relation to downtown, could some of those metro bike stations been placed one block over and not on a historic street where they film all the time? Right. I mean, that, that I would ask that rhetorically. Uh, and because that's something that perhaps could have been done, and that way they would never have to be moved, exactly. or, or very, very rarely have to be moved. And I think that, I'm, now I'm gonna just give my opinion, that if we really truly support our signature industry, then we'll have those kinds of conversations where we enter into acceptable trade-offs, because that seems to be what it's all about, because we, all, we always wanna support people getting on bikes and having that option but it doesn't need to be at the expense of our signature industry. And sometimes there'll be unavoidable conflicts, and I get that. Uh, but everyone should have a seat at the table to decide ultimately where those stations will go. And in terms of, uh, Marcel, you mentioned they could just be picked up because they're not attached to the ground. I wouldn't want to publicize that too widely. <laughs> <laughs> Things happen in the middle of the night in LA. But um, uh, what's the expense? Uh, for for that, um, so I think is you it have here the in the report? It's it's, um, a, it's a little over four thousand four thousand dollars. I see it. Yeah. It's four, four seven ninety. It's yeah. four seven ninety. That is if you uh, requested three days more than three days before. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's another twenty five percent, and it's yeah. a storage fee. So it gets to a point where it's seven seven thousand dollars when you put it all together. I think Ed's point earlier is essentially that. DO, the report has indicated that there haven't been many requests mm -hmm. to DOT. It's just not getting that far. They're calling yeah. Film LA. Film LA says it's going to be $7,000, and they say, forget it. We'll find somewhere else to shoot, or we'll and in speaking get a tap metro, card and move all the bikes. And in speaking something. of Metro, yeah. they, they have had more inquiries than just those two. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. people were, are asking what it takes and how much it is. Right. Um, and, and again, it's really about placement. I mean, I think that's the key to all of it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I know we had uh, for instance in down in San Pedro mm -hmm. there was one that was almost going to be placed on on the main drag there and it was moved around the corner uh, unbeknownst to really a lot of our input but mm -hmm. it did make a big difference to just that by degree. moving it around the corner yes right? exactly. yeah okay yeah that's the kind of that's just logical right so uh, how about recent uh, like planned expansions for bike share it are you all uh, have you made uh, the industry aware of where the next stations are intended to go? Well, we have not had that discussion yet. Okay, and how many do you have in the hopper? So we're um, we're looking at coming to city council in the next um, in the next month or two mm -hmm. to um, ask for an expansion of the existing downtown LA system, mm -hmm. and so whether whether that goes, you know, more into Echo Park to kind of fill in the gaps. We're also looking at MacArthur Park Pico Union heading west. Mm -hmm. Um, also, we recently were awarded funding in a joint application with Metro to do expansion down towards USC and along exposition, the exposition line as part of that. Um, we continue to receive interest from, um, from different stakeholders. Um, another one that it, Culver, the city of Culver City um, earlier, um, like a few months ago, um, adopted a position to do their own bike share system. Um, and so we're looking at also doing a simultaneous uh, rollout that would also cover the Palms area so that we can leverage the investment from Culver City. I think the appetite's definitely there. Yeah. But I think also uh, people who uh, use the bike share program trust that we'll place them in places that make sense, that mm -hmm. not at the expense of filming where they're, you know, uh, locations that are frequently filmed. Uh, so that's, that's important. Uh, and then... Um, okay, so you've answered most of them. Now, ha has DOT been attending uh, on a regular basis and reporting on the expansion program? There's a quarterly task force meeting, right? A quarterly citywide task force meeting. Uh, have have they been attended regularly? Oh, um, so 
The answer is yes. I'm seeing my chief of staff nod. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, any other points? And then Mr. Roo's going to have some questions. No, I, I think it sounds like there's an opportunity to do a larger presentation about future expansion plans to the citywide task force. And so I don't. I know that there's one coming up. I think next week, pr mm -hmm. perhaps Thursday. I think. So I think it, that might be a little bit tight, but maybe we can make it for the next one. I think we also would be waiting for um, council direction on future expansion plans as well, because we would need to get that authority. But again, we don't want to make that in a vacuum without input from th from the industry. Sure. Um, and so I would say, I have the date here, what, November 2nd at the Greek Theater? That's right. 2.30? Mm -hmm. I would say there's no reason DOT shouldn't be able to attend that. Someone uh, to hear hear the concerns and share the concerns. And actually, before Mr. Rue asks the questions, what about those green bike lanes? <laughs> um, so I think it was last spring we had uh, the, the committee, they were kind of reconfigured a little bit, but Paul Krikorian and I expressed great exasperation that the green color had not been resolved. Then I understood that it had been. I've heard recently that perhaps it's not resolved again. Or uh, do we, are we, we good with a green color or no? We believe it is resolved. Okay, That's amongst all point. parties. Yes. It really had to do with material the yeah. last okay. time. Not so much the shade, but the application. We had to go back out, look at it again to okay. see about the material, but I, I think we were all pretty much in agreement that that was the color. We oh, had hopefully. agreed We had agreed to a, a, a shade and application um, a couple of months ago, and then about a month ago maybe, we went out to look at another application uh, in the same shade, which we uh, approved. And so uh, hopefully uh, we're done with the green paint. <laughs> and it might, does it depend on the surface? Because there's a big difference between a color applied to asphalt as opposed to a color applied to concrete, right? Or, or no? No, it's just because it's just a it, it the had same to do color. With the amount of, it had to do with drying, and it had to do with uh, the material and how fast it dried. Okay. At least this was the reason why we were told it changed, was because in certain areas it was going in front of driveways, and if it didn't dry quickly, they were going to have they couldn't they had to do it at very small increments. So and it was sorry. a question of. And from our perspective, we we wanted to make sure the application was not um, not too uh, reflective. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, thanks for indulging me on that one. You're welcome. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and you know, I'm, I'm excited. Having previously sat on the old entertainment committee, I'm glad that it's back yeah. in this committee. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so are we. And I'm glad to hear that, 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 that long-term green paint <laughs> issue. I, I'm glad to finally hear it. Hopefully it's resolved. Um, but I, I think it's point and key, especially whether it's the green paint or whether it's the uh, bike share program, communication is key. And I concur with you, Mr. Chairman. The more communication we have, the better. A uh, couple of questions. So um, I know this is a report on discussions you guys have been having for a while. So is this now the rule, or is there still room for changes? The, the fact that it's $290 for turning it off to uh, about close to $5,000 or, or more for removal. Is that is that set in stone now? or? Yes, that is uh, the price sheet that we developed in conjunction with Metro, who is our partner on it and shares costs on the program. And that was based off of the feedback that we got from our, our contractor. Is DOT and Metro open to uh, additional new ideas or in the future? Yes, definitely. Okay, because um, I was initially reading your report, I was going to commend on, you know, I loved um, – all the outreach you did in the, with the discussion with, um, you know, reaching out to all the different stakeholders, but it looks like it, it looks like there could have been a little bit more communication. And I want to ask that question. Well, the question to the film industry uh, representatives here: um, Is it more that you want to um, remove? Can you film without removing the actual um, uh, the whole the station? The station, or it, just removing the bikes? Is that good enough? Or I'll it varies. You know, I mean, it depends. it depends on whether we have to, whether it's sitting right in front of a building that we're filming or whether it's just in the background. I mean, there, it varies on, on what we would have to do in the extreme. I mean, the, the one that is uh, down here in downtown is there's one sitting right in front of the ice cream s store, and that one is a little problematic because of where it sits. We've had a lot, we had a lot of discussions about moving that one, but there didn't seem to be a good place to put it. So. That one has stuck there. Um, there's a couple in the Venice area that are right in front of restaurants. Um, they could have been a little bit off to the side or a little bit moving. Down the moving it would, would have been helpful. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, those are the kind of things because of their, their where they sit, they can be problematic. And, and again, if we're doing something period or we're doing something that isn't Los Angeles, which we do a lot of, mm -hmm. 
um, it can it, become problematic. Yeah, it has to go. And you know, when we talk about moving, if you move the whole station and storage after the filming is done, do you move it back to the same location? Yes. Would you be willing to, um, if, if the film shoot is willing to pay for removal, while that's done, would you be willing to possibly consider, like, you know, around the corner? Or. I don't know if you'd want to do that on an ad hoc basis because there's definitely fees, like engineering, design right. fees that goes into it because it's solar powered depending on the mm -hmm. solar coverage. Um, so I think, I don't know if we'd want to do it on an ad hoc basis, but I think it's definitely something we can talk about. I mean, I, I'd love um, if you could continue this discussion and knowing the fact that it's not set in stone, I mean, and talk with the film industry representatives, whether it's at the meetings, at the, the quarterly meetings that everyone has, or whether it's on a separate basis to figure out if there's additional options. Because I think um, more than 290, you're right, why not just buy a tap card and just take the bikes out, right? And I mean, it's... And you're metro and you're still getting paid <laughs> and and it's much cheaper than the current solution so if you guys could continue to um, see if there's other um, um, uh, options available and especially if they do go after the removal part see if it's an opportunity to see because obviously whatever is in place now um, um, is is there already but moving forward I mean with the with the increased communication hopefully we could um, avoid um, um, hotspot film, film spots in the future. Um, so if you could continue to work on that. And I had a couple other questions. Um, so when you do remove, I mean, it hasn't happened yet, but do you guys have a notification system if you decide to remove or shut it down or remove it? Yeah, we, um, we would be able to e email all of our users and notifying them of a shutdown. Uh -huh. Recently, we had to uh, shut down a station um, for for like a long weekend, uh -huh. and so that was the Pershing Square station. So we actually had to um, we we did an email, and it's interesting because in those instances, you also start getting users saying, um, "This is my daily this is my daily mm -hmm. bike share station, and now I'm being impacted mm -hmm. because you shut it down for a concert." And so we're always going to see there's going to be these. Um, these multiple factors at play, you know, particularly when we provide, you know, because I think in many instances this, this is a mobility solution, right? I think um, particularly in downtown um, where you have 70% um, of the folks are pass holders, um, this has now become an integral part of the way they commute within downtown. Um, you know, anecdotally, you know, I've also met folks who, where that, that existing direct connection doesn't exist, so think about Union Station to the Fashion District, where um, previously in talking to stakeholders, they'd say it would take me um, two bus transfers, a dash to a local from the station. Now I just jump on a bike share and I'm there in 10 minutes. And so those are some of the instances of how it's starting to become part of people's daily commute patterns. Wow. And so they feel the impact um, when, when some of these stations are shut down. So doing but, but I think to, to that point though is we do a, we, we purposefully cite them within like a five to ten minute walk of each other so that it's never t we're never fully leaving someone isolated from from uh, from the bike share so besides the email you know the app does it take it off the app I mean does it turn yes okay I think you you just underscore the importance of minimal disruption mm -hmm. yeah. right everyone likes to know something they can count on with a minimal disruption which is why I think it's important to collaborate as closely as possible. I think some of the locations are just going to be really hard, but I, I think there are more opportunities than we realize for locating a permanent bike station maybe half a block away than where it's originally intended once meeting with the industry. Yeah. I think that's kind of where the sweet spot could be. Right, and the uh, second question I have is, um, so, and, and I like the fact that you are trying to minimize that this wasn't trying, you were trying to make money off the fact of, of removals or, or replacements, um, but the uh, removal fees, um, where's that money going to? Do you guys keep it or where does it go? Um, the fees are paid, I believe, to directly to Metro, correct? Um, to Metro, and then Metro uses it just um, as part of their cost. They'll probably get a bill from Bicycle Transit Systems, which is the operator. Um, in, in their in their monthly billing, then the previous the next month once they reconcile their accounts, the LADOT gets billed. Okay. Um, one sidebar. Um, I, I read your report. I was happy with it, except for on page three, where you talk about future expansion of um, of uh, of the uh, bike share program. 
I've been asking for it in my district for a long time. I would love it in my district, pending talking right. with the film industry. <laughs> pending talking with the film industry. <laughs> Key, and of course, multiple communication, but I would love, um, you know, I, I, I have, you know, Miracle Mile, Toluca Lake, Los Feliz, where um, it meets Griffith Park. I mean, there's lots of uh, um, bike-friendly places, and, and, um, and, and which I would love for this pilot expansion to uh, expand to with high consultation with the film industry. <laughs> Thank you, Council. And, um, and I'll do another plug, and this is why I introduced dockless bike sharing. Right? We would have the result, have this problem uh, to deal with if we had dockless bikes. But in any case, um, dockless. 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 Doc oh, yeah, dockless. Yes, yeah. so we're having some um, private companies uh, explore, and we're doing pilot projects on that. Okay. So no, no stations. Right. So, um, but, um, so uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know, for um, um, seeing, we don't need to do an instruction to ask them I, to work together. I have together, some recommended right? actions. Okay. Because yeah. I, because I, I would love for opportunities. Mm -hmm. If you could work with the film industry to see if there's any other options, because mm -hmm. uh, I don't see why you need to pay the two ninety to shut it off when you could just pay fifty yeah. bucks and just or or just permanently locate in right. less uh, volatile locations. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Or for existing ones, if it does get moved, somehow see if it's an opportunity to, while it's moved, instead of just bringing it right back, see if there's any opportunity to just move it a few feet, mm -hmm. if that helps. And I, I think that the bicycle community is the most well-connected social media community of any demographic at all. So yep. when, believe me, when anything happens, I hear about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if I don't want to. <laughs> um, all right, thanks. So, so anything else, Mr. No, that's it for all me. All right, so uh, here's my recommendations. Um, uh, re we'll receive and file the LADOT report. Uh, instruct DOT to attend task force meetings and identify specific personnel to attend regularly. I think that's really so these conversations can can be um, constructive and worthwhile and timely. And uh, because it sounds like this is moving quickly, and that's a good thing. Uh, there's no reason we can't prevent misunderstandings moving forward. Uh, furthermore, instruct LADOT to solicit input feedback from each council district um, and film coalition that meets quarterly whenever a bike share station is proposed and just share that information as soon as possible. Uh, it's best to, you know, hash it out in a meeting before a bike station shows up and, and people feel it's in the wrong place. Uh, so that, that'll be a lot better. Uh, those are my recommendations. Um, Mr. Chair, is it possible to maybe um, uh, do a report back to the committee? Maybe I don't know, in I don't know how many months. Uh, see if there's any additional uh, yeah, we'll, uh, options. We'll that definitely come. agendize this on a regular yeah, basis. So, because I would love for you guys to have discussion and see if it has any bears any fruit. Uh, yeah, and I know giving that more my, options. My team attends these task force meetings, and I I think they're open to all the council offices. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That would be uh, worthwhile too, but we'll we'll make this a, a regular report. Okay. As as the Metro Bike Share program becomes more robust. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, all right. So let's go to item two. Item number two: Department of Recreation and Parks report relative to the use of the herbicide Roundup at City Parks. All right, thank you. And we have Mr. We have the gentleman from Rec and Parks right here. Uh, please uh, identify yourselves for the record and uh, let's go through uh, the report. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, committee members. Matthew Rudnick, I'm a chief management analyst with the Department of Rec and Parks. I also serve as our sustainability officer. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, Javier Solis, superintendent of uh, maintenance operations, Rec and Parks. Welcome. So we'll be providing an overview of our report, um, specifically re relative to the use of the herbicide Roundup at City Parks. Um, about a year ago, your committee um, gave us instructions specifically um, to report back on findings on the use of uh, the herbicide Roundup and alternative products, and secondarily, um, to bring back policy and or guidelines to address limiting the exposure of park users and employee to herbicides immediately after their application. Um, so we've taken some time to develop some recommendations and bring them back. We'll do an overview and then happy to take any questions you have. Okay. Um, just by way of background, Roundup is one of the most widely used herbicides in the U.S. 
Um, it's used to control weeds and grasses in home gardens, agricultural, commercial, and government sectors. Um, it's a non-selective herbicide, meaning it will kill most plant foliage. Um, and it works to prevent plants from making certain proteins that are needed for plant growth, which results in killing the top layer of plants and underlying root systems. Um, Reckon Parks, like most large park agencies and government entities, um, regularly uses Roundup as part of our integrated pest management program. Um, it's a very effective weed control um, measure. Um, again, while glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, um, has been approved for use by regulatory bodies worldwide, there have been ongoing concerns about glyphosate's effects on humans and the environment. Um, recent studies have identified glyphosate as a probable carcinogen, while other recent studies contradict these findings. Um, so as a result, some community members and other advocates have voiced concerns regarding um, you know, the use of Roundup by public agencies and park agencies. Um, in light of these concerns and in response to your action about a year ago, we've, again, developed some recommendations and are presenting them for you. Uh, before I hand it off to Javier, who's going to talk about, really, our operations and the use of Roundup in city parks, I wanted to make a distinction, which is this conversation is happening um, in the context of a much larger conversation about um, Roundup as it relates to the agricultural application. Um, and genetically modified food crops and long-term exposure to Roundup or glyphosate um, by farm workers. Um, and I just want to make that distinction that that use in an agricultural setting is much different than a more domestic use um, in, in parks. Is it a different formula? Um, it, in some cases it is, but, but the same active ingredient, glyphosate, um, is, is present in both. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just say, um, and it was said in our last um, meeting to discuss this, is that we're taking the issue just extremely seriously given um, the carcinogenic potential um, and just wanted to make you guys aware that, you know, um, we have looked at this very hard and think these the recommendations we're putting forth um, are very sound and balanced. So I'll hand it off to Javier. Thank you, Matt. So once again, to reiterate, uh, I am the superintendent of the maintenance operations uh, citywide. And uh, under my operations, I have a couple of divisions, one division being the forestry division. Uh, this division is uh, responsible for our integrated pest management uh, program. Within this division, they are responsible for the application of herbicide, which uh, includes Roundup. Um, Recreation and Park uh, is uh, in charge of uh, controlling various unwanted vegetation on a daily basis throughout more than 16,000 acres of city park, parkland. Weeds not only can ruin aesthetic quality of park lands of parks, landscape areas, but uh, can harbor vectors and provide overwhelming sites for insects. Weeds uh, create favorable uh, harborage areas for rodents uh, for proliferation, impede access to critical utility areas, and carry f and uh, create fire safety concerns. Um, there's two different ways of dealing with. Uh, unwanted vegetation. Um, under the guidelines of recreation and parks, integrated pest management program, maintenance staff uh, use both uh, mechanical and chemical control measures to keep uh, unwanted vegetation to manageable levels. As part of the IPM program, similar to most public agencies, Rec and Park uses herbicides such as Roundup as an effective uh, vegetation control measure. Now, um, who are these individuals who are um, applying um, herbicide? Um, the IPM program is administered by trained professionals under the department of uh, under the department's forestry division, as stated earlier. Um, Recreation Parks Pest Control uh, technicians carry uh, California Department of Pesticide Regulation licenses and certificates. Now, these individuals um, have to take a test to make sure that, uh, and they have to pass the test to be able to be uh, certified, and um, to be able to retain that license. Every two years, they have to retest. And what is required? It is re uh, what's required of them is that uh, they uh, receive ongoing education and training to safely apply herbicide, such as Roundup. Um, these individuals all work under the uh, direct supervision of an on-staff state registered pest control advisor, who supervises them day in day out, who uh, advises them, who uh, directs them, and uh, uh, just oversees the overall operation. Herbicide ap uh, applications are scheduled uh, in response to job orders requested by uh, maintenance and recreation staff for weed control assistance. 
the technicians apply Roundup uh, to control unwanted weeds along fence lines, tree basins, fire roads, and other landscaped areas in city parks. I'd like to um, state that uh, we are overly cautious when it comes to um, employee and public safety. We are applying Roundup. Uh, when applying Roundup, recreation parks technicians adhere to stringent safety protocols, some of which go beyond regulatory requirements to mitigate potential exposure to themselves and the public. For example, when the herbicide application is made in the uh, park setting, the technician uh, sets up a barricade to define the area to which uh, herbicide will be applied to keep park patrons, pets, out, of, uh, out until the herbicide is dry. Um, while not required, recreation and park pest control technicians also post caution signs on barricades to increase public awareness of herbicide applications. What equipment is used to apply herbicide? Well, there's two pieces of equipment that are, that are used uh, within our department. One of them is being the uh, backpack pump sprayer, and the other is a tow-behind trailer-mounted trailer -mounted spray rig. Roundup is applied directly to unwanted vegetation in a targeted manner to help ensure that the, to help ensure that the herbicide only contacts uh, targeted weeds. Roundup is only sprayed when uh, Roundup is not sprayed when the winds are over 10 miles per hour. That's for safety reasons, to make sure that the, uh, the wind doesn't drift the uh, uh, chemical into areas that are, not, that are not targeted. Another example, once again, iterating that uh, safety is extremely important to, to our department. As an added margin of safety, recreation park pest control technician use the lowest possible label rate to target weeds. For example, Recreation park pest control technicians use 1% solution uh, compared with the allowed 2% solution recommended by Roundup. Uh, with respect to the safety of Rec and Parks employees, the te all technicians must make sure that they wear um, their PPEs. Personal protective equipment, which is extremely important uh, when they're mixing, when they're handling, and when they're applying. Uh, this may require uh, the usage of long sleeve shirts, coveralls, um, pants, Close toe, close, uh, toe shoes, uh, rubber gloves, respirators, and eye protection. Respirators are generally not worn as the, uh, as the, um, as the uh, description on the individual pest control management technician and are not required by uh, product label directed on the DPR. So, thank you, Javier. So again, we'll take any questions about that maybe at the end. Um, the next part of the report on page three, it talks about some of the recent research and studies regarding glyphosate. Um, there's a large body of research, and we, we did some research. Again, we're not the scientists nor the regulators, but we did want to inform ourselves about some of these recent studies and some of the public concern regarding glyphosate. Um, currently, the Environmental Protection Agency holds the position that glyphosate has low toxicity for humans and can be safely used by following product label directions. However, more recently, last couple years, several international agencies have evaluated the carcinogenic potential for glyphosate with varied results. And so the report talks talks about two subdivisions of the World Health Organizations that um, made separate determinations, one that glyphosate is a probable carcinogen, and another that glyphosate isn't a probable carcinogen if ingested or through the diet. Um, um, Based on some of those findings, um, in July 20, um, on July 7, 2017, this past July, um, the State of California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment added glyphosate to the list of chemicals. Um, uh, under Prop 65, which requires warning labels for products uh, containing chemicals on the list as probable carcinogens. Um, that's created um, some of the concern about glyphosate and the use of glyphosate in parks. Um, again, um, these two different subdivisions of the World Health Organization came to relatively different conclusions about um, the chemical, but according to the World Health Organization, the same chemical can have different effects at different doses depending on how much of the chemical a person is exposed to. So in this case, and in some of the literature we've looked at, risk is really defined as toxicity um, multiplied by exposure. So if you have a very high level of, of exposure, if you're a farm worker and you're uh, dealing with um, you know, glyphosate-resistant crops and dealing with glyphosate on an ongoing basis in a long-term basis, it's a much higher level of exposure, thereby a higher level of risk. Um, 
Again, so then according to the National Pesticide Information Center, glyphosate does not easily pass through the skin, and if absorbed through the skin or ingested, glyphosate passes through the body relatively quickly. So we believe that the applications in city parks that um, don't happen very frequently have a low probability or low chance for exposure to park patrons. Um, and we'll talk more about that closer to the end of the report. Um, it should also be noted that glyphosate or Roundup is undergoing registration review by the EPA. It's a program where every 15 years, pesticides have to go through a mandated review process um, um, through the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. So we will be reporting back should there be any regulatory changes on the chemical. Um, next, I'll just go very briefly through, um, we were asked to look at some alternatives and alternative weed control method methods. We looked at um, our, our pest control technicians, as, as Javier mentioned, they, they looked at some additional manual and mechanical methods. They looked at organic herbicide products um, and then some other methods that we'll discuss. Um, we regularly do use mowers, line trimmers, and hand pulling as weed control measures. Um, and in some cases, while these methods aren't as effective in controlling weeds as herbicides, we do use them as alternatives. So for example, most brush clearance for fire reg um, is done with line trimmers through contracted landscape service companies. And we think we can, um, essentially with more staffing and resources, uh, uh, depend more on these kinds of manual and mechanical methods as alternatives. Um, we also looked at organic herbicide products. There's a number of them and emerging products on the market. Um, some of these products include uh, substances like acidic acid, citric acid, clove oil, and lemongrass oil. Um, our technicians actually tested an acidic acid product. Um, it was effective, but it had limitations, um, and, and the report goes into some of that. But we're still exploring those. We don't think we can wholesale just begin using um, those um, products at scale with the park system, but we're going to continue to explore them. Um, and then lastly, we looked at other, other systems of uh, managing weeds, such as steam systems, burning systems, foam, high water pressure, and grazing sheep. Um, these were other... These are other uh, tactics uh, to control weeds. At this point, based on industry best practices, we don't recommend, again, that we um, implement them at scale, but we're going to continue to look at them. Um, lastly, the, the, really the, end the second part of the report um, addresses the, the committee's request that we look at ways to limit the exposure to park users. Um, we believe that um, our integrated pest management practices adhere to and in some cases exceed safety protocols, but we think additional measures can be put in place. So um, out an, of an abundance of caution and in an effort to mitigate risk potential uh, for exposure to children, other park users, and their pets immediately after an herbicide application, the Department of Rec and Parks will no longer apply Roundup to weeds within 100 feet of children's play areas, recreation centers, and dog parks. Um, this is, change. Is that new? That's changed. Yes. Yeah, so, so we'll, we will be doing this. I mean, essentially, um, after the committee um, adopts this report, that's going to be put into practice. Okay. Um, the change in protocol will increase the need for manual and mechanical weed control, and we think we can absorb that with existing staff. But any measures that take us beyond that would require likely additional staff and aren't really addressed in this report. Um, so our recommendations at the end of the report are for your body to receive and file this report, including those revised protocols that I just mentioned, and instruct us to report back to your committee should there be any significant policy or regulatory changes at the state and federal level regarding Roundup. Mm -hmm. The last thing I would say is um, we added some information, both an 800 number and a website for the National Pesticide Information Center. It's just a really good source of very objective information regarding pesticides. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's interested, we encourage to check it out. Um, so happy to take any Terrific. questions. So let's start with the last thing you just said, uh, Mr. Rudnick, and that is the, the phone number that you offer. Uh -huh. Do you offer that to park patrons who are concerned, who ask questions, or who protest, or? Sure, so um, it, you know, uh, concerns come at various levels. We might have a technician in the field that, that, is, that fields a, a, some concern. When we post our caution signs, there's some information, but usually it uh, re uh, um, refers them to the EPA. Or um, we also, on any um, canister that has any, any uh, chemicals, we have to post the label instructions, and that usually refers them to, to other sources of information. Um, but no, this 800 number isn't generally provided, and it's something we could think about providing. Sure. Yeah, maybe so. I, I don't know. What's, uh, generally speaking, what is your volume of calls for concerned park patrons yeah. for use of Roundup? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it um, it depends. It's, it's relatively infrequent. Uh -huh. Usually it's... Um, site by site, um, but often sometimes there might just be some kind of post on social media about an application and then we'll get a, a handful of calls, but it's pretty sparse generally. 
at times we will have a, a, a park patron uh, approach our um, technician. Sure. Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? And once you give them an explanation, they're good with it. Right. They walk away and say thank you for the explanation. So sure. most of the time we, we deal with some of those issues or concerns when uh, our applicators are at the site. I would imagine that people will receive the 100 foot stay away from sensitive areas and parks quite well. It's 100 feet, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's yeah. what that's what we're going to be putting in place. And I would also imagine that as many volunteer days as there are in the neighborhoods, that you could have a weed pulling Saturday <laughs> where you go into the children's play area and volunteers pull weeds. Um, I don't think that's too far-fetched. No, I don't think so. Or hire a goat or a <laughs> sheep or something. That's a little less realistic, but... That's right. Okay. Um, and then... Uh, oh, how often is Roundup applied to the areas where you apply Roundup how, on a regular basis? I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask um, one of our uh, staff members to come up and uh, okay. provide that answer. Yeah. Roughly. roughly. It doesn't have to be a scientific answer, yeah. but roughly every three months, every six months. Depends on if it rains, probably. Yes. Weather. Yeah, come on up. Yeah. Although you project quite well, <laughs> you'll need to come up Just anyway. for the recording. Yeah. And your name, please. Uh, my name is Marty Friedman. I am the pest advisor for the Department of Rec and Parks. Um, some of the parks require a little bit more frequent application depending on maintenance staff. Mm -hmm. um, we try to really minimize it. Most of the weeds that we're talking about are perennial in nature, which you can eliminate them either by topical kill contact or manual. Um, they just come right back. Mm -hmm. So uh, to answer your question, <laughs> um, two to three times a year okay. on most sites. All right. And again, you got to look at the picture. Here's a tree. We're only spraying a few feet around the tree basin to protect the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we've had incidents where it creates injuries, pathogens get in, and it just adds to the decline of our landscape. Okay. So it really helps the maintenance also um, to they can uh, handle other tasks in the park. Thank you. Specifically, uh, apply. Thank you, Marty. So, but thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Root. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think uh, you asked all the questions, so if I just had one question. Um, um, but so, um, so obviously we're still gonna continue using Roundup with all these new safeguards and everything else. Have, have RAP ever um, looked into organic compounds? tested at organic compounds? Yeah, so as, as in the report you'll find we, we have looked at some of those organic compounds, uh, uh, or organic products. Um, some of them can be effective, but there are limitations to them. So um, we're field testing uh, different kinds of compounds. One of the challenges is you have to use, it, use those compounds or, or products as a much higher um, solution. So whereas Roundup, it's like a 1% solution, 1% water, 99, I mean 1% uh, round up 99% water. Some of the organic um, uh, products require like a 20% solution, and they they can pose their own challenge and, and risks. They can be kind of noxious, the acidic acid solution specifically. So we're still exploring, though, the organic herbicide products. Okay, so I guess um, you'll get back to us on that, or? Yeah, I mean, our recommendation uh, would be, you know, for us, I mean, again, our, our integrated pest management uh, group um, really tries to rely on um, a lot of different tools to fight weeds and uh, unwanted pests. So we're happy to report back at your convenience and when you would like us to, our recommendation, we report back specifically on Roundup if there's any change in regulatory policy. Um, but again, it's at your discretion. I, I don't know if it was in your report or if I read it somewhere else, um, uh, but I know City of Irvine is doing a pilot project where they're um, testing this particular organic compound. Um, Love it if you could reach out to them and see um, how, how that's been being done. Yeah, and we have begin, begin to develop a list of um, contacts, other city agencies, other park agencies, um, some of our um, uh, neighboring cities. Um, in our, our, we understand the county of Los Angeles is reporting to, the, to their um, the board of supervisors to talk about its use of Roundup. So we're going to be evaluating and talking best practices with our, with our partner agencies. Okay. I don't necessarily want to direct you guys down that yet right now, but at the same time, I mean, in the future, we don't know uh, what's going to happen to the regulatory, and I know you're monitoring it, so if you could start exploring further about the organics. Absolutely. Thank you. And in as much that the EPA actually still exists and is functional in Washington, <laughs> D.C., um, 
and that really is a question. Yeah. Um, it's, it's good that the state is taking action on, on further defining the regulation of it. Question, glyphosate, uh, how biodegradable is it in the environment at the levels Rec and Parks currently uses? Sure, so, so two things, and, and I'm, again, there's a lot of science behind this, so I'm not, we're not, I'm a relatively a layperson, but I've done some research about the product um, and glyphosate specifically. There's differing um, studies, you know, in terms of the half-life. Um, glyphosate dries relatively quickly, um, and so as, as we've talked about, there's a period of time, it's called just no re-entry, where we would cordon off an area, and then we'd add that 100-foot kind of boundary. Um, uh, it, it, um, based on the research, it also it doesn't get off get get in runoff in terms of water. It sticks. It binds very tightly to soil. Um, but um, what I've read is um, its half life in terms of still staying within soil um, can be I think between like six and fifty days depending on environmental conditions. I'd just be curious to see what it does eventually when it filters down into the water table or, or just just the life expectancy sure. and the environmental effects of it, right. uh, even though we have reassurances that use 1% instead of the recommended two. And mm -hmm. uh, I just, it's, oh, okay, here we go. Step on up again, sir. <laughs> because that would be part of the thing that we could answer when people have concerns. Is yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of these other organic compounds are going to be a topical kill. It's amazing that after, since 1974, at the advent of the development of glyphosate, um, there's nothing as efficacious as this material. Mm -hmm. It's just worldly use. I don't think mm -hmm. there's any one product that's used more. Mm -hmm. um, but in the report, um, um, it basically just breaks down to a phosphate compound. Okay. And it after could, after could how last. long, Marty? After, after how long do we know? Um, well, there was a, a study, and depends if you're using it at a higher 2% rate, uh, mm -hmm. up to maybe 100 days. Okay. Basically a phosphate and water compound. Okay. So it doesn't, it gets bound up in the soil, it does not leach. Um, there is no grazing, so the farmers use it. There isn't any ingestion right. um, concerns. Thank you. And we're using even lower rates than what uh, Matt, uh, Mr. Rednick had. And so phosphate is found everywhere anyway. It just depends Pretty on much. how much concentration it adds to phosphate once it turns into phosphate. And yeah. that would be. The way the molecule is structured right. is pretty mundane. Okay. product when it breaks down. All right. Well, thank um, you. And I think, again, uh, we have never had an incident in the park mm -hmm. system. There's yeah. uh, just concerns of people, knee-jerk reactions. Or, right. And, and we have uh, some uh, materials we show people. Mm -hmm. A well-chlorinated swimming pool is seven times more toxic than the round right. pool. So and you don't have... Keep it in perspective. Tox, a dose makes a toxin as well. Sure. The aspirin, you blame the pharmacist. Right. But anyway, I don't want to... And you don't... Uh, run around with the in, in the parks <clears throat> parks with canisters that have the skull and bones and no. and all that stuff to scare. Our, <laughs> our signage is a, a regulatory where yeah. it's a Just red. So and this, people so get what you're doing and it's okay. yes. And we define it uh, like they had mentioned. It's mm -hmm. what we're using, who's using it, the contact mm -hmm. number. We're very transparent on what we do in the field. Great. Um, even you know we explored other, I know it's off subject, but even with our ground squirrel issues, mm -hmm. we're subterranean sure. installations. So I think uh, we're going way beyond the mm -hmm. call of our um, concern procedures. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, and once again, uh, when yeah. somebody has uh, raises a question or they're uncomfortable with what our applicators are doing, it's a simple, you know, five-minute uh, education crash course. And once yeah. they learn what's happening, they're good with it. Uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Solis. And just so, just lastly, uh, in terms of the uh, implementing the changes and stopping the use of Roundup in the sensitive areas beyond 100 or within 100 feet, when uh, about when will that be implemented system wide? Well, I mean, essentially, we've we started. To, started. I mean, yeah, and, and so as as we get calls, uh, uh, job order requests, uh -huh. um, the, our technicians are going to be begin begin implementing okay. that. Okay. Well, yeah. that's that's good news, and I think people will like hearing that. Terrific. All right, so uh, what I'd like to do is approve the recommendations of the Department of Rec and Parks uh, and uh, re uh, report uh, and note and file the information, instruct staff to uh, report again with any significant policy changes or developments in the evaluation of, um, of Roundup and glyphosate. Thank you, sir. Will do. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great work. Thank you.
And I think that leaves just one other item, that's item six. And Mr. Right. Ru, I recommend that we take item six on consent, the appointment uh, Zoo Commission appointment. Okay. Thank you. And uh, that's Clear. it. Yeah. Thank you so much. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.